So tonight we're just going to get right into it because we've got baptisms to do. And even though I told you all that we're going to do it at the beginning, I realized it's better to do it at the end so that you don't sit here shivering because you're still cold from the water. You see what I mean? Even Siri is excited about that or not. But the reality of it is um, it's better for us to do it afterwards. And so if you just want to celebrate and be in the spirit afterwards the way you want to, there's not going to be any hurry for you to come back into service. And that said, um, we thank God for the prophetic utterances that have been coming forth. I was telling Alan today that I'm just excited to see that we have a golden opportunity by God to not repeat what we did in 2020. Because in the year 2020, the Lord said to us very clearly, he said to me, and I, I didn't really know or take notice as I should until I was watching the video months later. He said to me, this word that's come forth today and that which I have shown you, you need to share with others. And we didn't really share it with others. We didn't even upload the video until, you know, much later on. And I'm like, man, how did we miss that? One day I was listening to, you know, some of the prophetic words that came about the year 2020 and things to expect afterwards. And I realized that even the Holy Spirit, as the word came forth, the unction also came with clear instructions of what to do to be faithful to that which we have been given, to that which we had received. So this time around, I just want to commend the ministry of Alan for taking the time uh, between himself and my wife, I believe, putting out the prophetic words so that we have, number one, a fulfillment of the responsibility that we have to prepare others. Remember when those banks uh, were shut down and they said they were taken over, how clear and express that word came uh, just about maybe, I don't know, three or four weeks before it happened. Um, things like that are very important just as reminders, okay? Let me tell you what they primarily are for. They are beacons that we are sending out to locate those who are of the same mind as we are. That's the primary reason why we're doing it. We're doing it, we're sending out signals so that the people that are looking, when they see that, they know that they are not alone. Because remember, the promise of God is for the remnants. He is coming for the remnant of the people. The Lord is coming for the remnant and uh, there was, you remember the war that was supposed to have broken the war, there was a war that was avoided in 2022, I believe late 2022, that was supposed to have included missiles being sent to America and, and structures being destroyed in the United Kingdom. And this was where we were at when the Lord opened my eyes to see other groups of people like us, other remnant assemblies or assembly of remnants that were praying. And the Lord said to them, the way that I have raised you up today, so have I raised them up. Now choose for yourself two witnesses that will stand here to announce that victory is of the Lord and that we will not be dragged into any senseless wars. And so when we put things like that outside or when we put those things out, we put them out because of the fact that basically what we're saying is if you're out there, we want you to know that we are in here and you are not alone. What I say to you today, I say because of the fact that I've seen certain things and I know that in the days to come, it will be very critical for you to know that you are not alone. In the days to come, it's going to become paramount for you to know that others exist, even though a remnant, even though a minority. Why? Because the man of God said, a time is coming wherein to find a man upon the earth. Will be, it will be easier to find the gold of Ophir than to find a man. We're talking about some of the rarest gold, gold that literally comes out of the ground 24 carat, no purification needed. Gold that is almost, it's so clear, it's almost transparent. And the Bible says that kind of gold, it will be easier to find it than to find a man. You know, we say these things not because we are interested in propagating fear, God forbid, because we have not received the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. 
We say these things because we truly want people to be aware of God's plan and what the holy expectation of heaven is. Because there are so many false expectations that have been sold out there. People have been sold on such an expectation that there will be a revival that will sweep through the land that will allow for the nations to hand over the reins of their political system to the church. People are saying things like that, but when you ask them, where is that in the word of God? They cannot find where it says in the word of God that in the last days that the miracles and the signs that the church will perpetrate will be so amazing to the Gentiles that they will give up the reins of power for the sons of God to come and run the political systems. You will not find that in prophecy, I guarantee you, unless it's a book on Amazon that was written by somebody who was looking to make a book. But if we're talking strictly about the mind of God as it has been revealed to his servants, the prophets, one of the things that we do know is that the expectation that we need to have should not differ from the expectation of the Lord Jesus. And what was Jesus' expectation of the times that we're in? What was Jesus' expectation of the last days? Jesus says, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? He says, I hope so. Sometimes we don't even understand the weight of that. This is Jesus, the one who was, who is, and is to come. The one before whom all things are made plain. And he was looking. He didn't say, after I return or after I go up to heaven. He says, when I return, that glorious day that is called the day of the Lord, that we have so earnestly anticipated. He says, when I return, will I find faith on the earth. And he wasn't particularly excited about what he was seeing. He says, well, I hope so. If Jesus is saying, I hope so, that means it's going to be few and far in between. It's just something that we have not been told enough and we're running out of time. Not only are we running out of time to do all of what has been committed to us, we're also running out of time to actually be as prepared as we need to be simply because Apostle Paul says you already know. Paul had such an expectation of us that things will be so clear by the time the end comes that we would already know so that the day of the Lord will not come upon us as a thief in the night. But guess what? Many people in the body are still asleep because of the fact that they have chosen to follow after men who say things that they want to hear. Many people have developed itching ears, always wanting their fancies to be tickled, not wanting to be challenged in any way, not wanting to have to make sacrifices, not wanting in whatsoever way to be reminded of the true heart and the experience of the believer. They don't want to believe what Jesus said when he says, the way they persecuted me, they will persecute you. What they did to me, they will do to you. The way they hated me, they will hate you. The way they came for me, they will come for you. People do not want to hear that because it doesn't sound as harmonious to their fleshy, fleshly desires. But at the end of the day, it has to be said so that you begin to Condition your expectation. You know, the Bible says that God guarantees one thing. That the expectation of the righteous will not be cut short. Will not be cut off. But that is only the expectation of the righteous. It's, it is not a righteous expectation to continue to anticipate. How many people remember the time of the last election wherein the majority of the evangelical movement was so adamant about the fact that all of their senior, not all, but, but majority of the so-called senior prophets and seers have said that this is the way the election is going to go. They were all over the Facebook. They were, all of, they were everywhere. They were in your face. You understand what I mean? But then because you want it to go a certain way, it doesn't mean that it has to go that same way. You understand what I mean? Because these things have happened before. That was what happened in the time of, his, of, 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 of Jeremiah. It happened also in the time of Ezekiel. Wherein the people want things to go in a certain way. And the moment the man of God or the man of God start to say something different from what they want to hear, 
rather than attack the flesh that is keeping them from desiring what's in the heart of the Lord, they attack the messenger. I would not forget how somebody called me and was trying to convince me to get off my high horse and believe the prophecy of some man out of Tennessee. I said, it is interesting. I said, because this particular man that you mentioned out of Tennessee, somehow his video came to my feed. And as I was watching, because I have learned not to watch alone, the ones who were with me in the company of innumerable angels revealed to me the spirit behind his unction. I said, so this particular, if you had mentioned somebody else, I said, but this one in particular, I saw Mammon and aggrandizement, one to his left and the other to his right, fanning the flame of a false fire. That which he said will not come to pass. The man hung up the phone on me. The last time I saw him, he bought me breakfast. But then suddenly now, because I am no longer saying what he wanted to hear, he hung up the phone. I tried calling him back. My phone number was not going anymore. So basically, not only did he hang up, he blocked me. And I'm like, wow, thank you, Jesus, for Google Voice. So I found another number. You know how the Bible says that a man, a scribe that is instructed in the things of God, brings from his treasures things both old and new. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have to be a man of means to claim to truly be a scribe. And so I brought out another number and I called him and he was like, hello, this is Omo Zomo. How can I help you? I said, no, I am here to help you. He was like, it's you again. I said, it's me because I wasn't done talking. I said, let me help you. I said, because your expectation is about to be disappointed because that which you said, the man said, is not of God. And here is the mind of God. Do not call Another one for salvation, but the one whose name is Christ. I said, do not exalt another one to the place of the Savior. And I renounced the things that he was saying. And it was like, are you done? I said, yeah, I'm done. Now over to you. It is now over to you to repent from dead works. He didn't talk to me again until he started to see that the arm of flesh had failed. Until they started to see. You see, at the end of the day, we cannot, we, we are only afraid to say that which we know to be the truth if we do not know who told us. You know, if I hear something from a day that is the truth, I, there's, a, there's a level of confidence that I would have because I, I, I didn't experience it. He told me this one is like a secondary truth. But when you hear from that inner witness, the Bible says for the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a son of God. When the spirit bears witness with your spirit, you will speak the truth regardless of what their faces look like. God said to Jeremiah when he was sending him out, he says, do not be afraid of their faces because I have made yours as hard as a flint. That word flint is the ancient word for diamond. And diamond was the hardest substance they knew at the time, which is oops, still the hardest substance we know today. He says, I have made your face as hard as a diamond. So no matter how hard their faces are, you win. Let us not be afraid to tell it as it is. You see, and the reason why some people were afraid, in fact, I think I may have been one of them for a brief period of time, was we were told to preach the gospel. And the gospel is defined as good news. And so whenever we say things that we don't think people will receive as good news, we may be susceptible to delivering it very timidly, simply because the people may not receive it as good news. But the good news that we have been asked to preach is one that we have to believe is good, not because the people think it's good. Let me say that again. The prophecies of the end times, the apocalypse of the times that we are in, the clarification and the expansion of the things that we have been warned about and the things that have been foretold are good news if they come from the Holy Spirit and from the angel of the churches. Because to you and I, they are good news. Why? Because we know that the unveiling of these events mean one thing, that our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. 
You see, the unveiling of these things guarantees that our persecution is about to intensify. And that is a thing of joy because we are meant to be like the ones who came before us. Not these other ones, but the ones who came after Jesus, the apostles. <laughs> because when they came out, the first time they were beaten in public, they began to dance. And they looked at one another. And Peter said to John, and John said to Philip, that in your life, would you have thought that you would merit such a privilege to be found worthy as a man to suffer the things that our Lord suffered? They said, look at us, what are we? They rejoiced in the Lord in great humility because of the fact that they were found worthy to suffer what things Jesus suffered. Why were they so full of joy? Because the words of Jesus were coming to pass in their lives. This is my thinking, and I'm sure it was their thinking too, that if Jesus said we will suffer and we are suffering, then that means those mansions are also as guaranteed as the suffering. That means the power that he promised is as guaranteed as he said, because now we are seeing the suffering. And that was the reason why when it was why when it was Apostle Paul's turn to suffer persecution, he gladly wrote down the experience in full for the ones who were coming behind. He says our light afflictions are but for a moment and yet they are working for us a far exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I am not anticipating a false revival that will continue to make people feel comfortable to carry on as they have been, business as usual. A revival that makes people foam in the mouth, a revival that makes them go into the same building, to the same place every night, sitting for the better part of the time in traffic, waiting to get to that one place just to have the experiences of falling down and getting up the same. I am not for such revival because such things will make men hardened in their hearts, believing that nothing needs to change, believing that they need to continue to have a false expectation of receiving a crown that is made by men. But we have been signed up for a crown that is made by God himself, an eternal crown. And that crown is given only to those who overcome. The crown that Jesus gives is not one that is a reward to those that have been awarded by men. If you have already been awarded by men, Jesus says, that's it. You have your reward. Friendship with the world is enmity against God. We need to be ready because... The time is near for us to receive the Son of Man and the Son of God. The time is near and for us to receive him, we need to have come to the end of our own assignment. And Jesus says, as I am, so are you. So the end of Jesus' assignment is the same end that the body of Christ, the, the true ecclesia, needs to anticipate. An end wherein even... <laughs> the tunic that was on his back was ripped from him. And you cannot afford to look back. You cannot afford to go back and say, um, Mr. Persecutor, that which you took from me, can I just borrow it one more time? I just want to take a picture of it before you take it. We need to be so ready that no matter what it is that we have to give up for the sake of being purified, we would give it up rejoicing. The ambition, give it up rejoicing. The associations, give them up rejoicing. You see, because at the end of the day, the Holy Spirit would let you know the ones who have run out of oil, who want to remain in your company so that they can deplete yours and still not have enough. You see, because uh, it is the glory of God to break us all, but it is your glory to stay and let him put you back together again. But some of these people have despised the chastening of the Lord. When the Lord came to break them, they were broken, but they wouldn't wait for him to mend them. 
So they are vessels that have leaks in them. So when you pour some of your oil into them, it is going to completely leak away and you will no longer have enough, neither will they have any. So like the wise virgin says, so that it may not be that we come to a situation wherein it is not enough for you and for us, we ask for you to go to the ones who buy, I mean, to who sell. You see, so it is time for us to be ready to lighten the load. And do you know how the wise virgins were able to make it until the bridegroom showed up? The Bible says after the foolish virgins took their shenanigans and left the room, they trimmed their wig. Let me tell you something. I had this revelation by the Holy Spirit that it is in the nature, the natural tendencies of women to want to behold their own beauty. But the Holy Spirit revealed to me that the five virgins chose to anticipate the beauty of the Son of Man, then to continue to behold their own faces. That was why they trimmed the wick, because what is in them to behold that compares to the bridegroom. Many of us are so consumed with our own pleasures, with our own self approved pleasures that all of the light all of the light that we have and the oil that we have we keep spending it looking at ourselves and then looking at others to see if they measure up it is time for you to trim your wig so that all that you see is what you see in the eye of your spirit the face of the beloved we cannot expend our resources anymore on foolish things. We cannot expend our resources anymore because let me tell you something. What I see is that the Lord has asked for the tape to be rolled. And that is why we're going to keep putting it out there. It may not attract the multitude, but it will help the remnant to locate us. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9. I remember the song. I have decided to follow Jesus. You see, the cross is before me. The world is behind me. Why is the world behind me? Because I have decided that I am not turning around to the left or to the right. I have fixed my eyes as a flint. And I am going for the cross. It doesn't matter how much of the gold coins I hear dangling behind me, I am not looking back because what is behind me is Sodom and Gomorrah. And to turn back is to become a pillar of salt. And Jesus is not coming for pillars of salt. He is coming for salt that is also light. Ah, you didn't understand what I just said. May the Lord give you understanding. In fact, he has given you understanding. You see what I said, the Holy Spirit said to me, I, I showed it to you that way because it will liberate the hearts of many. The wife of Lot turned around and became a pillar of salt. To become a pillar of salt means to be petrified. To become so weighty and so heavy that you cannot levitate. But Jesus says, I want you to be salt, yes, but not a pillar. I want you to be salt. A pillar is light, is heavy, but I want you to be light. So that when I call for you, nothing will keep you on the ground. The weight that made her become a pillar was the cares and the desires for the riches of Sodom that were in her heart. As soon as Sodom caught on fire, the connection to her heart also got activated. And if you understand anything about fire and petrification, then you know what just happened in that place. That fire did not just burn Sodom, it burned her heart. And she became stone. I say to you, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. Because when you love the world, your heart remains connected to the world. 
And the word of the Lord has come to us again and again, saying to us, sever ties because the ones who love them will perish with them. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9, here is the word of the Lord to you today, communion house. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. Unless the Lord of hosts left for himself a remnant, we would have become like the others. Here is the beauty of my charge to you today. What the Lord is asking for is a very tall order. What the Lord is asking for is what we call the true high calling. What the Lord is asking for is to forsake all and follow him. What the Lord is asking for is to allow your heart to become immune to deception, to allow your heart to become immune to distraction, and to allow your heart to become immune to any form of retardation by leaving everything in Sodom behind. When the 4,000 people that were followers of Jesus decided to leave him one day because of what he said. Jesus made a statement that was completely against the theology of the Jewish men that he spoke to. And I'm talking about the real Jews, not these ones. You see, when he made that statement, he said, you have to eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood. And they were like, we've been telling you, he's a false prophet. People started telling each other, did we not tell you? In fact, from the way he tells his parables, you can tell he's a ritualist. Because how can one who is of the seed of JC, how can one who is supposed to be the lion of the tribe of Judah, how can one who is supposed to be a seed of Abraham stand in the congregation of men who are meant to be called a royal priesthood and announce to them that they need to drink blood when the Bible forbids it? The law, the Torah forbids it because Moses was told by God to tell the people not to have anything to do with blood. He says, let not an animal be consumed with its blood for the life of the animal is in its blood. And that is the reason why they allow when they slaughter their animal so that all the blood is bled out. Kosher. And now you are telling us that we need to drink blood. So basically you are asking us to deny Moses. And these were men who knew prophecy, who knew that Moses himself said to the people that the Lord will send you another prophet like me. That's the reason why they call him a Messiah like Moses, a prophet as unto Moses. And so they were like, everything that we have believed up until now is against what you say, you're against us. We shall leave your ministry. And they walked, they walked away, 4,000 men. And he just gave them sandwich. He had just fed them. You know the significance of that? I asked the Holy Spirit, I was like, what's going on in here? Why couldn't you have just revealed their heart before giving them the food? And he said to me, he said, because they are a representation of the men of the last days. I was like, how so? He said, because the Bible says, you know the prophecy, that in the last days, men will become lovers of pleasure and what else will they become? They will become unthankful. They will become lovers of pleasure and they'll become unthankful. Were those two things not fulfilled? They, be, they were lovers of pleasure because the Bible says Jesus saw as they plotted in their hearts to make him king. After he gave them bread, they were like, we didn't even have to pay. We didn't have to work. The Romans, they don't even have to know about this. This man is giving us free food. It was better than the stimulus package. You understand what I mean? Oh yeah, because the stimulus package came and put all of us in some kind of spending spirit that is not sustainable. You know, there's a way you spend free money. It, you disconnect from your good sense. Easy come, easy go. You understand what I mean? If it's free money, it puts you on a cruise. Even though it was not enough to pay for a cruise. But then as soon as we got accustomed to that, Guess what happened? The prices of things started to go up and we're like, uh, mm, and they're like, got you. Got him. So you could say that I'm not an economic expert. 
in that regard and dis disregard what I say, it's okay. But the reality of it is I am an economic expert because I know what I'm saying. Because you've seen what I'm saying. These men were lovers of pleasure. They took the free food, wanted to make Jesus king. And as soon as he said something that they did not want to hear, guess what happened? They ditched him and they didn't even say thank you. They just left him. And Jesus looked at the 12 who remained and he said to them, aren't you going to follow them? You know, you and I would have thought that at least Jesus should have shown some appreciation for the guys who stay. I mean, if you're a pastor and 4,000 people, you have a congregation of 4,012 people, right? And 4,000 of them left, leaving you with 12. Aren't you supposed to be celebrating the 12? And start calling them, Brother Peter, God bless you. Thank you so very much. How do you want going to leave me? I I've always just known. Jesus looked at them and he said to them, will you not leave also? It's like having 4,000 people leave your church and the 12 deacons that remain, you're looking at them and like, what are you still waiting for? Just to find that test their hearts. And you know what they said? Peter leading the charge. He was like, Jesus, you have jokes. To whom shall we go? We have already left all to follow you. So literally, whether we like what you're saying or not, we are stuck with you. Whether we like where this is going or not, we are stuck with you until we have that mindset, like Job says, even if he slays me, I would trust in him because I have nothing elsewhere. All that I have, I already bet against this God. It's either we win together or we disappear together. But I have nothing else that I am looking back on. You see, if we are not of that mind in the days that we're in, we will consider the other river. Because you know that we have come to Shinar. And I've told you about the kingdom of Nimrod. You see, the world that we're living, that we're living in again, like I've told you multiple times, is Babylon in its structure, in its constitution. It is Babylon. It is Egypt in its regimentation because it is so hard on the called out ones. But then it is Sodom in its operation, immoral to the bone. And what was Sodom known for? Money and sodomy, homosexuality. So if you're still wondering if these are the last days, you must be born again. No, because if you're still wondering, that means you're not born again. You see, because anyone that is born anew, growing up in the family of grace will know the time that we're in. You understand what I mean? Because these are the same things that we are seeing again. And let me tell you something, what have we just read? The Bible says, unless, if not for the fact that the Lord himself has chosen to keep for himself a remnant, we would have been like those in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so how did Jesus extract his own remnant toward the end of his ministry? I mean, ministry. He did so by making following him difficult. <laughs> because if it was easy, everyone and their mama would be in his ministry. But the Bible says Jesus, he saw what was in their hearts. And because of that, he did not commit himself to them. So from day one, he wasn't with the multitude, even though the multitude was with him. So when the time came and they walked away, he was like, uh, did, we, did anyone just walk out? I, I heard the door swing. Well, what happened? Because as far as he was concerned, he didn't need the baggage. Because let me tell you something, you want to fly, the last thing you need is, need is 4,000 pillars of salt. You, your, your ship is not going to take off. Doesn't matter how powerful you are. 4,000 pillars of salt. Your ship is not going to take off. What do you do? You lighten the load. But that ship can contain as many beams of light as possible because when you are made of light, you are not a burden. Can I say that again? 
Your friends who are made of light, are they a burden to you? Family members who are made of light, they're not a burden to you? You never get tired of having them around because they're so full of life? They're not coming in to complain all the time. They're coming in with inspiration. Every time they have something that is bothering them, they've already put their cares on Jesus and they're just giving you a testimony update. You see, because the people who bring their burdens to you have no intention of getting saved other than to weigh you down because you are not the savior. You see, but when you've already cast your cares on Jesus because he cares for you and then you go to your brethren and say, you need to agree with me in thanksgiving because this is what the Lord has said. He has done it and I just want you to anticipate along with me. Such people can be with you all day long. They're not a burden because they are made of light. You know, yesterday I got a call from Nigeria that two of our most senior employees were kidnapped by bandits. And they, were fam they are family men, married with wives and children. And say that again. No, no, when I say married with wives and children, yes, one wife each and multiple children. Thank you, Rosemary, for making that clear before somebody goes to make a t-shirt and say as many as you can. <laughs> oh, yes. So each of them has a wife. When we were told, as soon as I heard, in fact, the way that I heard was interesting because when they were calling me to tell me firsthand, the Holy Spirit told me to wait. So I waited until they left me a voice message. And when I listened to the voice message, I was like, what say you, Lord? It was like, now call them. So when I called my brother, it was like, when I called him, he was praying. So he picked up the phone and I joined the prayer. And then I heard the Lord say to me very clearly, they will return. And so I, I saw the general manager, I saw him coming back to us. You see, if I had not heard the Lord, I myself could have been a burden to others because then I would be weighed down because of fear and uncertainty. But because I've already heard the Lord and he said he will keep them. I said, we haven't got anything to worry about. I said, only do me one thing. I said, because we need to be able to encourage others. I said, go and find out for me what happened to the missionaries that were kidnapped just a couple of days prior. They were like, they don't know what's going on. I said, I am being led to ask for you to go and find out. Because almost everybody else that we were talking to was sounding like there is no hope. Because they were like, oh, other people had been taken for two weeks and they don't know. They may have done things to them. I said, the, the Lord is saying, go and find out. And they came back to me and they said, they have returned safely. I said, kind begets kind. Not until then did I put a message out to the men's group and I said to them in the men's group, I said, this is what we need to do because the Bible commands that prayer and supplication with thanksgiving be made for all men. You see, you don't just put prayer, supplication and intercession on people without thanksgiving. Because the Bible says it has to be the complete set. So I said to them, I said, now give God thanks because the word of the Lord has come forth. Until we receive them, now pray for their families to be at peace and not to lose heart. I'm sure everyone who saw the order of that message prayed powerfully as opposed to fearfully. And as I tell you today, we need to be ready. You see, because of the fact that we have been tested in so many ways, but God forbid that we despise the chastening of the Lord. You see, because the trying of our faith is working out patience and ultimately character. What God wants is for us to have his character, for us to be immovable as he is immovable, for us to be like him, for us to be able to love when we are being hated, for us to know that we have been placed on top and not beneath. So that we are not threatened because a lot of the times wherein we have beaten other people like dogs, we did so because we were afraid. Most times when a dog attacks you, it's not because he's happy, it's because he's afraid.
Let's go back to that Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9. I pray for you today that your body will be light. That you will not be a burden to yourself, to others, and certainly not a burden to the kingdom of God. Hear the word of the Lord. I'm reading verse 10. You rulers of Sodom, give here to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifice to me, says the Lord. I, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you appear before me, who has required this from your hand? To trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the callings of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the, and the sacred meeting. I read all of those things to you because I want you to know that these are the things that the people had become accustomed to and the things that they have enjoyed doing and those are the things that they have associated with what God expects but God is saying that is no longer what I am looking for. I am looking for a remnant of the people who are willing to turn their back on the world. It is very important. We're going to wrap up now so that we can talk about baptisms in a little bit. I was speaking to my brother earlier today and I said to him, I said it is interesting that the more we answer the word church, the more we become like house servants. Because the word church means house. The more we just want to please the lords of the land. The more we answer the word church, the more we want to just be inside of some kind of safe place because the word church means house. But that word that was translated church was not translated, it was replaced. The original word is ecclesia. And ecclesia means the ones who are called out. And the process of calling us out is not going to be any different from the process of calling Lot and his family out. Many people will be called out by God but not willing to get out, leaving everything behind. And those people will perish with Sodom. Let me tell you the implication of what Isaiah was saying. Isaiah did not say that we will simply perish. He says we will become like Sodom. Because after the brimstone, after the sulfur tirades were fired by the angels of God against the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, all of the land of Sodom and Gomorrah became pillars of salt. Everywhere was completely reduced to their component minerals and they became stratified, they petrified and became rock. Let me say to you the, the meaning of what I just said. You see, it is a tall order. It is a high calling. It takes so much to be able to meet this requirement. And please do not listen to the ones who said, oh, but Jesus already paid the price. And the Bible says that there is no further requirement. Yeah, for the remission of sins. There is no further requirement. He already paid the price for your sins to be forgiven. He already gave to you all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. What are the spiritual blessings? Forgiveness of sins, eternal life, hope, sound mind, righteousness. We have, you have received all of these things. Jesus paid for it. But then, even though he's paid for it, he's still asking you, to believe and to follow him. Jesus is not going to obey on your behalf. He's done his obeying. Now it's your turn to do your obeying. So this is one of those requirements that remains. It is required for you to remain in the faith when he comes. Because if you don't, then you have made his sacrifice of no effect. Because that is what they be saying to people out there. That you don't have to do anything. The Bible says, having done all to stand. Stand ye therefore that you may be able to withstand the opposition. 
That was not in the Old Testament, my friends. That was a New Testament apostle speaking under the unction of the Holy Spirit. The same one who told you that by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works. The same apostle says you have to stay in. I hope I have succeeded in making it sound like a difficult thing to do. Because that was my mission. So that you can then recognize that it is not you that will do it. But it is him that will do it in you. Not just for you. He will do it in you. So what do you do? You trust him completely. Let me, let me explain this. Let's use money for example. God will highlight some relationships to you that you need to walk away from. And you're like, ah, oh, but if I walk away from that relationship because they're sapping my oil, that may affect my business. I may lose some money. The Lord is saying, I want you to trust me. Because what I'm asking you to do is to forsake all and follow me. Because if you don't forsake all, whatever is left in you that is of the world is going to weigh you down when I come to lift you up. And so you need to be able to trust him to say, you know what, even if... They take it all away from me. They cannot take away the new creation that I am in Christ Jesus. And in Christ Jesus, I have all things and I abound. So what do you do? You keep moving. And that is how the Lord has chosen to preserve for himself a remnant by, by laying down the strategy to say that I just need you to find nothing more desirable than being with me. I need you to seek no other face, not even yours in the mirror. Trim your wick so that your focus is on the one whose face brings you light. I tell you all folks today, it's a great thing that we're having baptisms because one of the things that baptisms represent is the foregoing of the old and the embracing of the new. Nicodemus came to Jesus. He says, no one can do these things except the Lord is with him. And Jesus was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, you must be born again. So even if you have proof that the Lord is with you, Jesus says, we still need to fulfill our righteousness. We need the demonstration that you have chosen genuinely to become part of the new creation by being buried under water again as the earth was under water in the beginning. Because the earth was under water and God called the earth and formed man and that was the first birth. The man was born out of water. And that's why we use the word birthing for ships. When a ship comes out of water to land, we say that it births. So you have come out of water. And someone was like, well, I wasn't made from the dust. I was formed in my mother's womb. What is your mother's womb? Your mother's womb is essentially a replica of the earth. It is water. You cannot have a baby in the womb without water. Once the water breaks, we need to get that baby out. If, and you're saying to me, well, I'm more sophisticated than you, Mr. Moses. I was formed in the test tube that has water in it. I know y'all have seen sci-fi movies. Every time they be making babies in the Matrix and in all those things, where are they? They are in some kind of fluid. They make it look fancy, but I have a revelation from God. You know what that water is? Water. That fluid is water. Because there is no other way. You have to, the only passageway to coming into the earth is through water. You cannot come in or go out without going through water. Can somebody please go and tell NASA so they stop wasting billions? The only way out is through water. But then of course they already know, don't they? You know, people want to go outside of this earth and they're shooting rockets up. And I'm like, that is so dumb because the way up is down. If you want to get out, you have to go down and crawl under the base of the firmament and then you can go to the top. The moment you do the work of digging deep, you don't have to do any more work. You don't even need any fuel because the water will take you. You didn't hear what I said. I'm quoting to you scriptures. What the Bible says, you just allow yourself to go down. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and then it will lift you up. You see, because when we humble ourselves and we go down to the base most, by the time we get to the bottom, we don't have to do anything else because we will then be in the waters that are beneath the waters. 
And that is called the water of the grace of God. And it will take you. Can I prove to you that the waters that are of the great deep is a symbol of the grace of God? Remember that video that you sent me earlier? Adi sent me a video about the, 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 the waters of the great deep. The waters of the great deep were the waters that the Lord spoke to to come out of the ground to raise the ark of Noah. The water that was coming from above was judgment, but the water that came from beneath was life. That was what raised Noah up. It is the grace of God, the water that comes from the great deep. And that was the reason why the son of man had to go into the deep to become that water so that he can lift us up. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And as soon as he was lifted, you and I have levitation. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and it will lift you up. The more you give up the things of this world, the lower you become in the cadre of the world system. And the lower you go, the closer you are to receiving the help that lifts you higher than the heavens. I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, the son of man has spoken and he will not lie because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And as he has come to you, he sends to you once again a messenger today to remind you that he seeks to find faith on the earth even though it will be in the remnant. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you have to be ready to sign up for being one of the remnants. Oh yes. So, Water baptism is exactly that, allowing yourself to go back into the water in the presence of many witnesses and then being raised to new life. Jesus says, I'm doing it to fulfill our righteousness. He, he, he didn't, he, he let us know that it wasn't any ritual, you know, that when you come out, you expect that your skin would change, that if you were 45 years old, then when you go and you become 28, you know, Jesus says, no, 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 it's none of that. He says, this is how you fulfill your righteousness. You just do it so that you demonstrate to heaven that you're ready to be called a new creation. And so I want to call forth Diony today, who, is, who has boldly come forth. Praise the Lord. She came forth and she said, I want to be baptized. Do you want to come up here? So that one day someone can see you on YouTube and say, oh, so that's where she's been going lately. I see. And so if they stop talking to you because you come here, then you know they're not of the remnant. Because whatever we put out here is beacon. We're sending signals to our kind. And that's what we were doing and you found us. And now you become one of us, ones who are willing to leave all behind so that they do not become Sodom, they do not become Gomorrah, but that they become Zion. They become the city of the living God. Those who have chosen to sign up and be part of the remnant. So that when the Lord fulfills that which he has promised, which is to make it difficult to follow him, you will still find it easier to follow him because everything else is impossible to you. I'm saying that again because the Holy Spirit said to me, he says, you didn't say it enough. You didn't finish saying it. The Lord is making it difficult to follow him. For a purpose. Because if it, was, if it was easy, then he will get people who are not willing to make the true sacrifice. He says the true sacrifice is not the bulls. You just heard that. David told us what the true sacrifice is. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. And how does God break our spirits? By making us choose the water that comes from above. By making us choose to stand before him and let him examine us and find us to be made of gold. Anyway, praise the Lord for you, the honey. And don't be confused about the waters from above. I used one in the sense of the waters above the firmament and the waters beneath. But then I was referring to the first example that I gave to you of the two rivers, which Shinar is. There's a river that washes you down into sin and there is another river that cleanses you of sin. We have come to a point wherein we have to choose. That is the whole assignment of Satan. Satan's assignment is to bring you to Shinar. And when you get to Shinar, you choose. Will you choose life or death? Will you choose to obey or will you turn the stone into bread? Will you bow for free so you can get Satan's gifts? Or will you choose to suffer affliction with the remnants that you may be lifted up in the end? We have come to Shinar. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this one. And I want you to say in the presence of these many witnesses that you are willing to be buried with Christ and to be raised with him. Because that's what water baptism is. To symbolize the burial with Christ 
and then to be raised with him. Are you ready? All right, I want you to say. I'm ready to be buried with Christ, with Christ and, to be and to be raised with him. With him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All righty. In y'all's presence today, righteous.